Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart Lecture Series. Uh, we have today Dr. Sharmila Dorvala that will be speaking to us about imaging in cardiac amyloidosis and the use of the different modalities. Dr. Dorvala is a director of nuclear cardiology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and she's a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Dorvala is a cardiovascular imaging specialist with clinical expertise in nuclear cardiology and echocardiography. She has received the Eugene Brownwell Teaching Award from the Brigham and Women's Hospital and a research mentorship grant from the NIH. Dr. Dorvala also has served as a past president of the Cardiovascular Council of the SNMMI and the ASNC. She is a current associate editor of the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology and the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. She serves on the editorial boards of the journals Circulation, CVI, and Amyloid. And Dr. Dorvala's research is focused on amyloidosis, as she will be speaking today, and has been funded by the NIH, AHA Foundation, and industry grants. She has over 300 publications on the topic, and it's a great pleasure to have you here today, in particular from the airport. I know you're very busy, so uh, an extra thank you for you. Thank you so much, Leandro. It's really an honor and a pleasure for me to join your group virtually. Uh, I hope you're able to hear me uh, okay and um, this progress as well. So these are my disclosures. I will be talking a little bit about um, F18 flow beta pair, which is an unapproved uh, use of the tracer. So to start with uh, the outline of my talk, I'll give you a little background about amyloidosis, then jump right into our topic, imaging targets in amyloidosis. How are we imaging with echocardiography, magnetic resonance imaging, cardiac spect, cardiac PET, and then end with some conclusions. So we all know that amyloidosis is a protein misfolding disorder. Over 30 different proteins have been known to misfold into this characteristic beta pleated sheet structure. And this format is independent of the precursor protein. The diagnosis has conventionally been made using Congo red staining. Uh, I hope you're able to see my See my pointer. I'm trying to see if I can. We see. Better. There you go. Yes. So characteristic um, red staining here. You would see this also in hematoxylin and eosin, but uh, this is the characteristic staining for cardiac amyloidosis, for amyloidosis uh, in general. Okay. So the beta pleated sheet structure, Congo red positivity. On top of this, because any number of different proteins can cause these two pathologies, you need immunohistochemistry or mass spectrometry to type this amyloid precursor protein. So diagnose amyloidosis and type it uh, using immunohistochemistry or mass spectrometry. The two main forms of amyloid proteins that affect the heart are the immunoglobulin light chain amyloidosis or the transthyretine amyloidosis. Immunoglobulin light chain amyloidosis is a plasma cell dyscrasia, belongs to the family of multiple myeloma. In this situation, misfolded immunoglobulin light chains affect multiple organs in the body, most commonly the kidney and the heart, but they can affect multiple organs. This disease is a rapidly progressive disease, and without therapy, the median survival here is less than six months. Transthyretin amyloidosis, on the other hand, is caused by misfolding of transthyretin protein. So what is transthyretin? It's a transport protein that transports thyroxine and retinol, which is vitamin A. So this protein is produced by the liver. It normally exists in all, uh, all of us. This uh, protein, either because of a mutation of the TTR gene or because of aging, becomes unstable breaks apart, and these monomers and dimers are much more aggregation prone, resulting in hereditary ATTR amyloidosis with mutations or a wild type ATTR amyloidosis, which is a disease of aging. The reason there's so much um, discussion about the topic of amyloidosis is in addition to the imaging advances, we now have treatment advances. 
So this particular study was published in 2021, and this is a CD38 antibody, and this is called daratumumab. When daratumumab was added to conventional state-of-the-art treatment, which is cyborg regimen, then this study showed that these patients had much better outcomes compared to conventional treatment with cyborg D. This is the first drug that is now approved for treatment of AL amyloidosis. But one thing I wanted to point out on this graph is even in the patients on standard of care plus DARA, which is our current standard of care, DARA to MIMAP plus cyborg D, you can see that these patients at 12 months have nearly 20% mortality, nearly 20% mortality. And this study excluded the cardiac stage 3B patients. The sickest patients were excluded from this trial. And this is important to understand because in addition to treating the plasma cell disorder, which is what we're doing with this treatment, there's now role to do additional therapies of the cardiotoxicity of the circulating light chains, as well as in removing the fibrils possibly to further improve the outcomes of these patients. For transparent in amyloidosis, tefamidus is the first approved therapy for ATTR cardiomyopathy. In this large placebo-controlled um, phase three clinical trial with 18 months uh, of uh, treatment, 441 patients were randomized in a two to one to two fashion to tefamidus 80, 20, or placebo. The results shown here, patients on the pool tefamidus arm had much better survival compared to the placebo arm. You can see that the curves only start separating after about 15 months. But again, the interesting point here is at 30 months, you see that the patients who are treated with tefamidus still have about a 30% mortality. So this treatment is the best we have at this point, yet associated with a 30% mortality at two and a half, three year time point. When you look at the subgroup analysis of this particular study, what the investigators showed was patients with NYHA class three, those with advanced symptoms, did not seem to benefit as much as patients with class one or class two symptoms. So this again highlights the point that early diagnosis of this disease may be important because therapeutic response is better in patients who are diagnosed early. There's several other novel therapies that are currently under investigation, both for the precursor protein and for fibril uh, removal. Daratumumab, we've heard about uh, tefamidus, then there's uh, silencing therapy, inotersin, patisiran, butyrisiran. There are multiple investigational studies, AG10, which is a treatment, which is a TTR stabilizer, and implantersin, which is the next generation after inotersin. Fibril degrading therapies currently are an active phase of investigation. The Calum study is ongoing in AL amyloidosis patients. The company Atralis is uh, running phase one clinical trial of their compound ATO2, and the NEO-OD is actively being uh, studied to come into phase three clinical trials. So how do we diagnose these people so that we can treat them? So the current diagnostic evaluation is really starting with a suspicion of amyloidosis, either based on clinical symptoms or based on imaging findings. Then because of the poor outcome of patients with light chain amyloidosis, if cardiac amyloidosis is suspected, one of the initial steps to take is to make sure that this is not light chain amyloidosis. So you perform serum and urine immunofixation electrophoresis and serum free light chain assay to ensure that you're not missing the more malignant form of the disease. If this test is negative, then you move on to confirm the presence of cardiac amyloidosis and using bone avid tracer spect imaging, we can non-invasively make a diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. If this test is positive, then you go on with genetic testing to make sure that this is not a hereditary form of disease. And if this test is negative, in a patient who has typical phenotype symptoms, a negative AL amyloidosis evaluation, 
further testing, including endomyocardial biopsy, should be considered. If AL amyloidosis evaluation is not negative, if any of these are abnormal, then these patients should be urgently referred to hematology for biopsy of either the fat pad, bone marrow, or involved organ to make a definitive diagnosis of a plasma cell dyscrasia. And if that is confirmed, then you could uh, evaluate these patients with cardiac biomarkers, troponin T, anti-proBNP for staging and for prognostic assessments. So what are the uh, imaging, uh, two, two areas where imaging has a role? One area is to suspect amyloidosis in the very first step in patients with appropriate symptoms to suspect amyloidosis, imaging has a big role. And the second area currently is when you're suspecting transthyretin amyloidosis, if you exclude AL, that is where we have a role with bone avid tracer SPECT. There is an investigational area where in patients with suspected AL amyloidosis, the F18 uh, beta amyloid tracers and the Etralis tracer are now under investigation and have uh, promising results. So what are the imaging targets? So this schematic shows cardiomyocytes with extracellular space in a healthy heart. In patients who have high blood pressure or increased afterload from aortic stenosis, this myocyte hypertrophy with resultant ventricular hypertrophy, typically left ventricular hypertrophy. On the other hand, if the myocardium is infiltrated, you may see biventricular thickening. And this biventricular thickening is not necessarily accompanied by myocyte hypertrophy. The myocyte size may be normal or even decreased. And the extracellular space is expanded by all these infiltration. And in the case that we're discussing today, amyloid infiltration. Increased wall thickness, both left and right ventricular wall thickness can be nicely imaged with echocardiography or magnetic resonance imaging. And in a patient with biventricular hypertrophy, infiltrative pathology needs to be suspected. Gadolinium-enhanced magnetic resonance imaging provides excellent information about the extracellular space expansion. And this ECV expansion, if it is diffuse and if it is significant, more than 0 0.40, it's most likely amyloidosis. And there's also certain typical gadolinium kinetics that can suggest that this particular patient has amyloidosis. However, all of these features are not necessarily specific for amyloidosis as a disease per se. And there are a number of other conditions where you may see these changes. The primary pathology here is infiltration with amyloid fibrils in the extracellular space and targeted radionuclide imaging, either using SPECT or PET tracers, at this point appears to be the most specific way to diagnose this condition. Therefore, there is an increasing role in using a non-biopsy imaging-based evaluation using molecularly targeted amyloid tracers. And this has completely changed the field from a rare and underdiagnosed disease to one that's being increasingly considered and increasingly diagnosed at earlier stages. Echocardiography, as we all are taught, is one of the initial tests that you perform and that should raise the suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis. When you see thickened myocardium, with a granular sparkling appearance with small pericardial pleural effusions, that's when you start thinking this may be amyloid. Interatrial septal thickening as well as thickening of the valves is also a feature in amyloidosis. Most of you may have heard about the characteristic pattern of the global longitudinal strain where the mid and basal portions of the ventricles are severely impaired in longitudinal contraction with preserved longitudinal contraction in the apex. And this is called the apical sparing pattern of global longitudinal strain, which looks like this. Restrictive filling pattern is a feature of advanced disease. And of course, biventricular thickening 
is one of the features that should lead us to suspect amyloidosis. GLS is abnormal in about 93% of the patients in this particular study, abnormal S prime in 77% and restrictive filling in 35% of patients. By the time you see all of these features, the patient has advanced cardiac amyloidosis and our goal nowadays is to not only diagnose amyloidosis, but to diagnose it at a stage before this degree of advancement. Longitudinal strain is very simple, easy to use, and can be repeated. So this large study from the National Amyloid Center in UK looked at changes in longitudinal strain in patients with AL amyloidosis and the prognostic value of these changes. So here they showed that Longitudinal strain as it declined was associated with progressively worse survival. And on the bottom, they showed that patients who had an improvement in longitudinal strain had better survival compared to patients who did not improve their longitudinal strain. Based on this, these investigators are now suggesting that we can incorporate changes in longitudinal strain into AL staging as well as into response criteria. So current staging is based, uh, was reported from Mayo Clinic originally and then subsequently modified. And this is the current staging for prognostication in AL amyloidosis based on anti-pro BNP and troponin T levels. Stage one, both below uh, these limits. Stage two, either one abnormal. Stage three, you can see anti pro BNP is abnormal, but less than 8,500, and troponin T is also abnormal. Stage four is where your anti pro BNP is more than equal to 8,500 nanograms per liter. So, this is the group that was excluded from the daratumumab study because these stage four patients have significantly elevated mortality within the first six months. So they were not included in the DARA study. So now the London group has suggested to add global longitudinal strain to stage one, they say preserve global longitudinal strain. In stage two, longitudinal strain between minus 16.1 to minus 12.2, so on and so forth. And severe disease is more than equal to minus 9%. And they also add this to response criteria and current response criteria are only based on anti-pro BNP with no organ level markers that are described. And they say that you can go ahead and add longitudinal strain to look at stringent cardiac response, cardiac response, stable disease or cardiac progression. When you look at TTR amyloidosis, this is one of the studies that was published by uh, Scott Solomon. And in this silencing therapy study, what they found was that uh, with petisiran, they saw that the mean LV wall thickness change was slightly more compared to with placebo. Same thing with relative wall thickness. Global longitudinal strain was stable with petisiran, but progressed. Uh, with placebo and so on and so forth. So silencing therapy does appear to show some degree of um, changes in cardiac phenotype. Other investigators have looked at left ventricular work indices in cardiac amyloidosis. So if you have advanced echocardiography machines, you can develop pressure volume loop type images using this equipment. At our institution, we use a GE equipment for this. So you can get your longitudinal strain, you integrate it with arterial blood pressure and coordinate it with the mitral and aortic valve opening and closing to get the pressure volume loops and you can estimate myocardial work efficiency using these metrics. So these investigators have shown that patients with the lowest tertile of myocardial work index had much worse outcomes compared to patients in the mid and in the highest sterile. 
at our institution, a uh, study led by um, Gerard Giblin and Dr. Rodney Falk looked at patients who were treated with tefamidis compared to a previous era of patients before tefamidis was available. So 23 patients with tefamidis, 22 untreated patients. And what we showed in this particular study was that change in global longitudinal strain was worse in the no tefamidis, so the pre tefamidis area, and change in myocardial work index also was worse in the tefam no tefamidis era, and change in myocardial work efficiency, again, was worse in the no tefamidis area. So this is not the same patients before and after, which would have been ideal, but still gives us a sense that in a very small number of patients, 22 patients in each cohort, we are able to see differences between the tefamidis and the non-tefamidis cohorts, suggesting that these indices could have an important role in assessment of response to therapy in the future. What is emerging in uh, echocardiography is exercise echo. This group of investigators looked at um, inotropic myocardial reserve. And here you can see group B controls and in red group A, cardiac amyloidosis patients. And what you can see clearly is that the stroke volume with increasing bicycle exercise does not change in the amyloidosis patient, whereas in the controls, it increases appropriately and goes down with recovery. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, same thing. Amyloidosis patients demonstrate an inappropriate and abnormal increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with peak exercise compared to controls who don't show that change. And when they plotted peak exercise cardiac index against peak exercise VO2 max, then they showed that cardiac amyloidosis patients had really, really abnormal values, whereas control patients had uh, much better values. Again, suggesting that in amyloidosis patients, hemodynamics of the heart and lungs are both impaired and exercise may be a useful feature to bring out these manifestations. The next advance in echocardiography is machine learning. There are a number of investigators looking at this. I'm just sharing with you one of these studies where they looked at a phenotype that is increased left ventricular wall thickening. And then they just showed that using machine learning techniques, you can separate, you can separate amyloid from non-amyloid uh, causes of left ventricular wall thickening. This requires more refinement, but there's significant advances in machine learning approaches to at least increase the suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis. So what's future for echocardiography? I think the next level of innovations are going to come from imaging the myocardial microphenotype using myocardial texture and radiomix-based measures because currently we are lacking myocardial tissue characterization with echocardiography. This test is widely available and anything we can do to improve its utility in that area could be very helpful. Measurement of myocardial stiffness using ultrasound techniques is another important uh, advanced uh, in this area. Amyloid targeting contrast agents, uh, I hope some companies will make them so that you can make some type of uh, echo contrast agent, which can help us tell that this increased thickness in the myocardium is amyloid and not hypertrophy. And uh, we are studying ultrasound therapy in cardiac amyloidosis to see if that can improve myocardial perfusion in these patients. What about magnetic resonance imaging? Most of you are familiar with the typical uh, diffuse late gadolinium enhancement pattern. The characteristic structural abnormalities of, MRI, uh, of amyloidosis are well imaged with MRI, biventricular thickening, as well as your small pericardial pleural effusions, diffuse LGE, including right ventricular and atrial LGE. Extracellular volume imaging has been a huge advance in early disease detection and native T1 imaging 
can help us diagnose this disease at an earlier stage and without the use of contrast. Both ECV and native T1 mapping are quantitative, providing useful measures to assess response to therapy and prognosis. What's emerging in, um, in um, amyloidosis and MRI is looking at myocardial tissue characterization. So this is a study uh, from our group led by Dr. Sarah Cuddy, looking at 48 patients with AL amyloidosis with new diagnosis and increased cardiac biomarkers and 21 patients who've been previously treated for AL amyloidosis and currently in hematologic remission for more than one year. What Sarah showed very nicely is, although these two groups of patients have very similar extracellular volume, the treated and the untreated group, we are able to find differences in native T1 as well as differences in T2 in the treated group compared to the untreated group. So for the same degree of expansion of the extracellular volume, the tissue characteristics are different. And this brings us to the question that, what happens to amyloid after the bone marrow is treated? Does it invite any changes? Does the amyloid resorb over time? And is there any additional change such as fibrosis that sets into the myocardium? So this is all a new area of uh, investigation. We could not study these until now because we really didn't have good treatments. And with daratumumab and all the other novel therapies, we now are in a position to study myocardial changes using advanced imaging metrics. Response to therapy is another area and ECV being quantitative could be a useful uh, method to study changes. So this is data from the National Amyloidosis Center in patients receiving petisiran compared to 16 untreated patients. And what you see here is the untreated patients clearly worsen their ECV after one year, whereas the petisiran treated patients stabilize the ECV. So clearly no treatment results in disease progression and treatment definitively seems to be stabilizing the disease as a mean for the group with some people having some worsening and some people having improvement. So the London group went on to look at changes in ECV and the prognostic value. Again, what they found in 176 patients is that regression of amyloid is not common. Only four patients showed regression of amyloid at six months, okay? But most of the patients were either stable and some patients progressed. And the reason for this is even though you have um, treated the bone marrow, depending on how quickly the bone marrow responds, there may be continued amyloid accumulation. And data like this are leading us to believe that the sooner you stop the production of these immunoglobulin light chains, the better it may be for organ response. And on the right side, you see the same stable progression regression at six months, one year, and two years. And clearly you can see that the number of patients who regress seems to go higher at one year and even higher at two years. But most importantly, remember, we are only treating the plasma cell dyscrasia. We are not treating the amyloid and ECV is measuring amyloid. So the question is, why is the ECV improving over time with treatment of the plasma cell dyscrasia? And this could be because the body is able to naturally resorbe amyloid over time. And again, you can see that about 40% of the patients regressed in this study at two years, which tells us that 60% of the patients were either stable or progressing. Again, suggesting that we have ways to go with treatment in this disease beyond treatment of the plasma cell dyscrasia. We probably need adjunct therapies which can help these patients get rid of the amyloid fibril 
and improve their long-term cardiovascular outcome. So here's the extracellular volume change, again, shown in an image format at six months, one year, and two years. Again, you can see mean changes or median changes in this case are very, very small compared to baseline, the baseline being zero. We have also looked at myocardial composition and changes with therapy in a smaller cohort in a prospective study. And Dr. Olivier Clerc from our group presented this at the last ISA meeting. And in this particular study, what we found was that extracellular volume shown on the right, compared to baseline, there's a slight increase at six months and a decrease at 12 months, but no big change from baseline to 12 months. And here there's a difference. But when we look at native T1, that continues to increase from baseline to six months to 12 months. Again, suggesting that although the ECV is not changing, there is change in the myocardial composition. There is something changing in the myocardium with time from baseline to six months after plasma cell therapy and 12 months after plasma cell therapy. So these sort of data give us more uh, hope that we can do something better in the future. What's emerging in amyloidosis? I think diffusion tensor imaging, this is a technique that's been used for brain imaging since the early 80s. In uh, this is a technique where image contrast is proportional to the diffusional motion of water within the tissues. It's a non-contrast technique, so you don't need gadolinium. And the two metrics that you're seeing here are MD, mean diffusivity, and FA, which is fractional anisotropy. Mean diffusivity just gives you a measure of freedom of water diffusivity, and fractional anisotropy is on a scale of zero to one, and zero is free diffusivity without restriction. So these investigators looked at controls, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, AL and ATTR amyloidosis, and clearly you can see compared to controls, AL and ATTR patients have significantly impaired mean diffusivity as well as significant abnormalities in fractional anisotropy. And in HCM, you can see selectively the septum is more impaired or abnormal compared to the other myocardial areas showing the regional abnormalities here uh, in this disease. Uh, we've talked about doing diffusion tensor imaging and our uh, physicist, Dr. Michael Jerish Herald, um, tells us that this is a very challenging technique because of cardiac motion. So we need more advances before this technique can be widely used. The other advance in um, MRI is pulmonary water imaging. So in this study from the Oxford group, they looked at exercise in the magnet and they compared controls, type two diabetes, HFPEF and amyloid patients. And what they showed was stress-inducible changes in the water content were highest in amyloid and were also high in HFPEF compared to controls and type two diabetes. So basically this is a new method to look at water content with exercise in the magnet. And this is something that uh, will likely uh, be important. Now let's spend the next um, 10 minutes talking about radionuclide imaging. So I'll start with SPECT imaging. And this is a seminal paper from 2016, which told us that if done appropriately in patients presenting with symptoms of heart failure, suspected amyloidosis, in whom light chain amyloidosis is excluded, then grade two or grade three uptake of either PYP, DPD, or HDP is nearly 100% specific for diagnosing transthyretin amyloidosis. However, note that sensitivity of this was only 70%. So what does that mean? So in 30% of the patients who have suspected amyloidosis, this test may be negative when you use grade two or grade three uptake. But on the other hand, we choose to use the grade two, grade three uptake because it can avoid the need for biopsy because you are 100% specific. So keep in mind when using this technique that you want to operate at high specificity so as to avoid need for endomyocardial biopsy. But on the other hand, 
In patients where you have a high clinical suspicion, you may want to proceed with further testing, including biopsy as needed. So this is what the societies recommend now, that if you have a grade two, grade three PYP, if AL amyloidosis is excluded, in a patient with symptoms and typical imaging features, you have made a diagnosis of transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, and you do not need biopsy. For AL amyloidosis, you need systemic biopsy proof of AL amyloidosis, either fat, fat, bone marrow, or any other involved organ. And in the context of a patient with systemic biopsy proven AL amyloidosis, an abnormal cardiac biomarker level or abnormal imaging features would confirm the diagnosis of cardiac light chain amyloidosis. What we have seen from recent publications is that the non-biopsy approach using imaging is now being used increasingly and bone scintigraphy-based diagnosis is now taken over relative to tissue diagnosis shown in blue here. So this is data from the Teos registry. It's a global longitudinal observational registry of patients with ATTR uh, variant disease as well as wild type disease, including uh, gene positive patients who are asymptomatic. But again, this is very, very important information suggesting that bone habit scintigraphy is now being used, biopsy is being less often used. What does that translate into? Data from the NAC, again, the National Amyloid Center from UK, they looked at changes at various time periods and they showed that NAC stage one, which is in blue here, is increasing over time, suggesting that by using imaging-based diagnostic methods, we are detecting more patients with a more favorable prognostic stage compared to previous periods where we had a lot more patients in stage two and stage three disease. So because of this, the patient cohort of patients with ATTR cardiomyopathy diagnosis in the current era is very different from the patients who were enrolled in the ATTRACT study. And all the current ongoing studies, the attribute CM, uh, Apollo B, Helios B, cardiotransform, and all of these, are enrolling patients with transthyretin cardiomyopathy with less advanced disease. And this may mean that you need more patients or a longer follow-up to, sh to show effectiveness of these new drugs in this disease. The next phase of this um, bone avid scintigraphy is quantitation. In addition to looking at a visual image where you see grade zero, no uptake, grade one, uptake less than rib uptake, grade two equal to rib, grade three greater than rib. This is what we are using in the clinic currently. What we can do with advanced spec CT scanners is quantify using standardized uptake value metrics, quantify cardiac amyloid activity as a volumetric measure in the entire heart and percent injected dose. What's the value of quantitation? It may potentially help us detect early disease. It can help us uh, detect changes in disease with treatment. A recent publication just came out last week in the European uh, Heart Journal Cardiovascular Imaging. This is from a group in Vienna, and they used a very specific SUV retention index and showed that in patients, they looked at 40 patients, they used a median uh, change in SUV retention index to split the cohort into A and B, and what they showed was patients who had a greater change in SUV retention index. Those patients showed a greater reduction in anti-proBNP. They showed a greater change in global longitudinal strain. And more importantly, a subgroup of them, 12 of them had cardiac MRI. And they showed that ejection fraction improved in this cohort with improvements in retention index and right ventricular ejection fraction also improved. Why are these data important? It's 40 patients, 20 in each group. It's a very, very small study. These data are important because so far with TTR stabilization, we have not been able to show significant 
cardiac structural or functional changes. In the ATRACT study, again, patients with more advanced disease compared to the current era, using echocardiography, we were not able to show big changes. But now using magnetic resonance imaging, in this study as well, they showed no significant difference with echo. But with MR-based metrics, we are able to signal, look at a signal of change, specifically, specifically when you categorize the patients using the radionuclide method. So you have cohort A who have a better change in retention of uh, DPD compared to cohort B who have a smaller change in DPD retention. So again, suggesting that changes in molecular imaging of amyloid may stratify the cohort better into responders and non-responders and provide helpful information uh, to guide these patients' management. So the Patisaran study, again, Mariana Fontana and colleagues uh, published, uh, we talked about this. So the baseline compared to one year, the median baseline ECV was 46, one year median is 48, but ECV declined in 38% of the patients. But in this study, when they looked at DPD, percent injected dose improved by 20 per, uh, nearly 20% and 94% of the patients showed improvement. So it was a 20% change and nearly almost all the patients showed an improvement, 90%. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that patisseran therapy results in amyloid resorption or does it mean that there is some other secondary pathology such as amyloid uh, myocardial fibrosis? Is there altered biodistribution? Because with DPD, we know that it goes to the heart, bone, and soft tissue. So the question here is, you're seeing the heart apparently less because there's more rib uptake compared to here. So altered biodistribution. And finally, maybe stopping the precursor protein, removing the monomers and dimers causes some changes in the fibril from a growing fibril to a non-growing fibril. And does that somehow change myocardial uptake of uh, bone avid traces? So a lot more unknowns and all of these are unknowns because we do not understand the mechanism of myocardial uptake of bone avid traces. So here's an example of a patient uh, who had an equivocal PYP scan. This is spec, spec CT, we were not very clear. We called it grade one. This patient went into a clinical trial and got fluorbitapir PET CT and I-124 P5 plus 14 showing clear evidence of myocardial amyloid. Again, when the patient has a high clinical suspicion, if your spec scan is equivocal or negative, consider further evaluation, typically with endomyocardial biopsy, which we did in this patient, but also in the future, we can expect to see amyloid binding PET traces. So the big advantage of the molecular PET traces is they can not only show amyloid in the heart, but they can show whole body amyloid uptake. More importantly, we know that these beta amyloid compounds bind to the beta pleated sheet structure and the I124 P5 plus 14 is binding to electronegative surfaces on glycosaminoglycans or amyloid fibrils in this case. So the mechanism of uptake is well known and being PET tracers, they're more quantitative compared to PET. These tracers, uh, in this case, I124 P5 plus 14 shows um, AL amyloid APO A4 amyloid, and we can see multiple organ involvement, liver, spleen here, and kidney involvement in this patient. Contrast that with a negative case where you see no myocardial uptake, no other organ uptake. Multiple amyloid tracers have been studied and all of them in single center studies show that control patients have much less retention of tracer compared to amyloid patients who have significantly higher tracer retention. In this particular study, these investigators showed that in transthyretin amyloid, there is a much more rapid washout of chlorbeta ben compared to AL amyloid. And this is something that we had also noticed in one of our earlier studies, 
where we found that the retention index in ATTR is less than retention in AL amyloid. Significantly greater than controls, no question, but ATTR seems to have less uptake. Similar findings with C-Lev and Pittsburgh B compound with ATTR lower retention compared to AL, but significantly greater than healthy controls. With the I-124 tracer, we have preliminary results, uh, which showed that here's AL in this left here, ATTR in the middle and controls on the right. What we found was that, again, with floor beta pair in orange, ATTR signal is a little low compared to AL, which is much more widespread. But with the I-124 tracer, we are seeing if any, slightly higher uptake in ATTR cases. So if this is um, validated in a larger number of patients in a larger cohort, what this could mean is that this tracer may be able to detect early amyloid deposition in the heart, uh, for example, in patients with hereditary ATTR um, gene mutations, for example. So we also uh, found that floor beta pair can detect early cardiac AL amyloid, data from our lab by Sarah Cuddy, showing that in patients who are currently called as non-cardiac amyloid, because they have normal wall thickness, normal biomarkers, we see that half of those patients have floor beta pair retention index, which is similar to patients who have cardiac amyloidosis, either the treated remission or the untreated group. Same thing with ECV. In this non-cardiac group, half of these patients have abnormal ECG and about half of them have normal ECG. So again, suggesting that molecular tracers may detect early disease. Here's a PET positive patient compared to a PET negative patient. Both of them by current criteria are non-cardiac amyloid. What's emerging in this area is uh, the question of whether there's fibroblast activation in the heart and fibrosis. This is a recent publication uh, from Jack Cardiovascular Imaging showing late gadolinium enhancement in patients with various stages of light chain amyloidosis and FAPI imaging. This is a tracer that binds to fibroblast activation protein inhibitor. And there you can see that in patients with Mayo stage 3B, most advanced stages, 3A and 3B, there's FAP activation. And there's also some FAP activation Mayo stage 2. But in the earliest form of disease, Mayo stage 1, there seems to be no FAP activation. Again, these, if um, validated in larger cohorts, may have important management implications for these patients. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, a variety of proteins can misfold and form amyloid fibrils. Two of them most commonly infiltrate the heart, resulting in remodeling and heart failure. We currently diagnose this disease, uh, at least suspect the disease by clinical manifestations, perform structural imaging, and then confirm our diagnosis with either bone avid tracer scintigraphy or biopsy and then treat the patients which, who are diagnosed such. So the diagnostic evaluation currently is proceeding from right to left. We hope that with molecular imaging, we are able to change this. We are able to diagnose by imaging amyloid before there's overt um, structural changes in the heart and before there's overt severe heart failure so that these patients can be treated at an early stage and can have better clinical outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Dorvala. That was wonderful. And uh, I love the, the last slide. I think it was, it was great. And so please put your questions in the, in the Q&A and, and we'll go through them. Uh, I will start with one question uh, coming from what you were saying and some research that we're doing as well. In, in patients that are at high risk for, for AL amyloid, should we be waiting for, for symptoms to develop? That is kind of what we do, or should we be doing early asymptomatic imaging? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, again, in AL amyloidosis, cardiac involvement, once the heart is affected, outcomes really get worse. 
I think a case could be made for early screening of these participants. Now, how do you screen these patients? We are currently using cardiac biomarker testing. So we're doing antiprobe and P and troponin P. We do not have, um, and if they're abnormal, then we'll proceed with further imaging, including echocardiography and other testing, MRI. Uh, but currently we don't have any approved uh, radionuclide tracers for light chain amyloidosis. So the F18, um, tracers and the C11 tracers or beta amyloid tracers can image AL amyloidosis extremely well. And these are likely going to be the first tracers which are available for imaging AL cardiac amyloid. So the floor beta Ben compound is currently undergoing a phase three clinical trial in Europe and maybe a few centers in the US um, for imaging AL amyloid. So those results could be extremely helpful in making us have a tracer to image this disease. Thank you very much. Uh, Aldo, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, no, I, you know, again, this is uh, it's great to, to uh, hear you, Dr. Ravala, and then just uh, you know, uh, get exposed to kind of the new in amyloid and uh, so much has evolved since I was there in the, in the lab with you and learning a little bit of amyloid uh, in the lab. So. You know, the, the, I have kind of one question, and 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 you know, in clinical practice, what I've seen, and and I want to see again your input is that, you know, often we try to separate AL and ATTR, but uh, you know, um, rare, rarely, but often we can see that they in the same patient we have both, and 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 um, you know, even in, in biopsy, so you think that's common, and um, you know, uh, what's your experience on that? Because then sometimes we face this this challenge, which. Uh, it looks like ATTR, you know, we send uh, PYP is positive, but then the, the light change is a little positive and, and you're in the conundrum. Uh, and the, sometimes I guess you need to figure it out with biopsy. Yeah, so that's an extremely important question. Um, thanks for asking that because there are many scenarios where you could see that it's not common, um, but the most common scenario where we might come across that is Patients who have a monoclonal gammopathy, which is seen in 25% of older adults. Mm -hmm. So if you have monoclonal gammopathy plus TTR amyloid, right? In some of those patients, if you send the biopsies for immunohistochemistry, it may look like AL because the circulating monoclonal proteins are sticking on the amyloid. And Rodney Falk and others have published on this and shown that mass spectrometry may be necessary for diagnosis in those cases because immunohistochemistry may read out AL, which in fact it's not. The other scenario where we may have seen this is patients with AL amyloidosis who have undergone stem cell transplant, who have had received successful therapy, maybe they were in their 50s or 60s, and now they are in their 70s and 80s. So the hypothesis there being if there is a nidus of amyloid from previous AL amyloid disease in the heart, yeah. with aging, if the TTR becomes unstable, those patients may be more prone to aggregate and develop TTR amyloid of aging. So that is a situation where we have seen that people who are long-term survivors sometimes can come back and we are worried that it's a recurrence of their AL disease, but in fact, it's not, it's just that they have the second pathology with aging and whether the first pathology has predisposed them to the second is an interesting question. Yeah. So, but more importantly, the clinical implication of what you raised as a question, the most important implication is to make sure that we are not missing light chain amyloid because without treatment, median survival is six months. So half of your patients will be dead in six months. So delay or um, incorrect diagnosis of AL amyloidosis can lead to very poor outcomes for the patients. So when in doubt, I think it's important to get the hematologist. First of all, not when in doubt, look for it proactively and get the hematologist involved in every case where there's any abnormality of the light chain studies. Thank you very much. Uh, so going with that, uh... Dr. Garcia asks a similar question. Should we screen all patients with multiple myeloma for ATTR amyloid? Yeah, no, I think uh, that's an excellent question again. Hi, Mario. Thank you for joining. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so I think all patients with multiple myeloma have these circulating monoclonal proteins, whatnot. Um, so what we are doing is a, a number of them get echocardiograms, as you know, for their chemotherapy treatments. So they are getting serial echoes. So you have the opportunity to look at their global longitudinal strain and things like that. And then you could also look at cardiac biomarkers. About 10 to 15 percent of patients with multiple myeloma will have coexistent amyloidosis. At this point, I don't think people have figured out exactly how to identify those patients, uh, but these are patients who probably warrant close follow-up to detect the presence of amyloid when it happens. So it's not everyone, but about 15%. Yeah. And you talked about the LV and looking at strain. Uh, should we be looking at that solid function uh, and at the LA as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think diastolic function is very important to look at. And atrial involvement, we are just looking at that from our group and other groups. So we always think that amyloid is a diffuse disease which affects all the chambers, which is true. But uh, atrial involvement has some characteristic features. When the atria are infiltrated, you the atrium almost becomes like a conduit. It doesn't have the contraction. It becomes very stiff. And it, so atrial arrhythmias, atrial thromboembolic phenomenon, all of these are common. We are beginning to see that atrial abnormalities may be some of the earliest manifestations of disease. And by the same token, it's possible that changes in atrial function may be earliest markers of change as well. So that's a new area that needs to be studied further, but that's what's coming out about the atrium. Thank you very much. Uh, from Dr. Travin, he asks, what is the likelihood of PET amyloidosis agents being FDA approved soon? Yeah, so the likelihood is non-zero at this point because one trial is ongoing. <laughs> Before this trial started, we would have said, we don't know because no one, none of these companies are taking this uh, compound to trial. Uh, but yes, so the first um, trial is ongoing in Europe. They've already enrolled the first few participants, Florbita Ben. Um, so hopefully we should see results. I'm positive that it works for AL very well. Uh, my question is how well does it work for ATTR? So that's something we have to wait and see. A question from Dr. Diaz, heart failure fellow. Is the sensitivity of the PYP the same for all types of ADTR cardiomyopathy, or do you change anything according to the type? Yeah, again, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so uh, PYP is more sensitive for ADTR than AL, more sensitive for ADTR than AL. But within ATTR, there are data to show that some of the hereditary forms of ATTR may be negative with PYP, DPD, and HDP. So those patients, the PET tracers have been shown to be positive. I shared one example of a wild type case with you guys. That's how the hereditary cases would look like. Your PYP may look negative, but there's a high clinical suspicion and echo, MR, and other features such as cardiac involvement. And you proceed, there was one paper, um, in JNC, which looked at C11, PIB, and DPD, and they showed that uh, DPD was positive, particularly in patients with what they call type B fibrils. They are like full length and fragmented fibrils, and one of those fibrils has more uh, uptake with uh, DPD than the other. So PET tracers are helpful because they bind to all forms of amyloid. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Daniel Lorenzati. This awesome talk. He says, there is data from Mariana Fontana's group correlating CMR with DPD findings that suggests that in TTR amyloid, most of the time there is a correlation with the CMR stage of infiltration and the DPD uptake in the opposite uh, to the AL, AL amyloid. So do you think we can suspect the type of amyloid just from CMR and PYP before the light chain evaluation? Excellent question, excellent question. Um, I think most current techniques um, can identify, at least MR can nicely separate amyloid from non-amyloid hypertrophy. So I think MR, especially if you look at gadolinium kinetics and washout and the uh, ECV, we can detect it. 
The challenge, as I mentioned, is we have moved from an era of advanced disease diagnosis to an early diagnosis. So in this time where we are looking at early diagnosis, ECV, mild abnormalities in ECV can be seen in many forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, including amyloidosis. So if, if our goal is to diagnose early disease before this overt phenotypic change of thick ventricles, expanded, massively expanded ECV, then structural imaging by itself may be limited. So I think until we know more about this disease, we need to combine multimodal imaging approaches. So if your ECV is 0.35 and your PET is also abnormal, I think I'm more confident that this is amyloid. Uh, whereas if your ECV is 0.35 and the PET is negative, then it's unlikely to be amyloid. So those sort of things, I think we need to learn more. We need to learn more from um, the multiple uh, imaging approaches. Well, one question that I have is that, you know, is kind of related to this is that, I mean, we're trying to identify the disease early, but then we have these kind of uh, scenarios when we have a, you could have a false negative, but we just mentioned with the ATTR, in which perhaps MRR, MR can pick it up. So I guess my question is, when do you think there is a role for MR in the diagnosis of amyloid? Uh, in which clinical question, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, spec or PET uh, tracers? Uh, or when then they can, I guess, complement each other and how you do that? And is finally, is there a role for PET MR, you know, as we were just talking before? Yeah. Yeah, no, all great questions. So I, I tell you, I think the algorithmic approach varies from institution to institution and from the patient to patient, right? So if you have an older adult, typically most of these patients have some form of echocardiography. So you have symptoms and echocardiograms. So older patient with echocardiogram showing thick ventricles uh, and your AL evaluation is negative. So those patients, I think going straight to PYP, DPD, HTP, probably makes sense, uh, probably makes sense. But if the patient's not old, then I think MR has a huge value in those people because there it could be AL amyloid, it could be hereditary amyloid, it could be these things where PYP, DPD would not help. So I think that's one approach is to look at the older cohort where you're suspecting wild type TTR disease compared to the others where you're thinking of other possibilities. But of course, MRI probably has a much bigger role than nuclear techniques for looking at um, treatment response at this point, because you can look at changes in ECV, changes in um, the cardiac structure and ejection fraction and all those other things. So, um, so the way I put it is for sarcoidosis, we have um, FTG, MRI starting, then if it's positive, you go with FTG and follow up with FTG. Uh, for amyloid, I think you start with PYP, DPD, whatever, uh, for TTR, and then maybe follow up with uh, MRI to look at changes and things like that. And of course, in younger patients with AL and other suspicion, MR probably may be better. That's a, a great summary. So thank you very much again for, for the lecture. We don't want you to miss your flight. So, <laughs> so hopefully we'll see you in here in New York soon. Yes, thank you so much, Leandro. Thanks, Aldo, Mario, Mar Mark Travin, everyone.